And all right, the recording has begun and it is, uh, I just can't believe how time flies. It's June 20th, 2024. Uh, this is the, the Edge uh, live demo and discussion. Welcome, I'm Tim Quast. Along with me is Brian Wilson, uh, market strategist, and we're gonna divide this. So uh, what we like to do is each time, I, you know, I like to spend some time on mechanics and uh, Brian will pick up big picture trends oftentimes. And I think that's kind of how it uh, falls out, shakes out this time. So. Let me share my screen. The first item on my list is to is to talk a little bit about, again, I'm sorry if this is repetitious for you longtime users, but if you're new, I wanna come back to this. You know, how do we know what the market is going to do from day to day or week to week? Well, we don't, but we can get a pretty good idea uh, by looking at, the, at what we like to refer to as the broad sentiment B, uh, the context, what's occurring in the market, and then where the divergences or absence of them reside. And, and so I wanted to come start right off here with broad sentiment. By the way, if you are using this uh, through, through the interactive brokers, and we're in kind of a waiting situation right now, um, and it shows up in a, in a number of things, like there's not quite as many people in the demos, it's because we're, in a, we're waiting for them to make some decisions very happy with what we're doing with them and the thousands of people are using that data. You know, I, we can see that stuff uh, and, and we're happy about that. But we, we also, you know, it's valuable IP. <laughs> I'll show you where to look at this uh, in, via interactive brokers as well. But this is, this is a, uh, I want to say this is a 90 trading day view. I believe that that is the default for broad sentiment. I mean, you could count it up, but I think that's what it is. So, you know, it runs us from March expirations all the way to June expirations. And what you're looking at if you're new is supply and demand and price. Three big things we look at. Uh, we, the, the price component here, that's SPY, and clearly it's done very well. Uh, the demand side, which is the green part of the graph, that will correspond to the uh, to the primary y-axis is the green part of the graph, uh, once again, and that's a 10-point scale. It's an algorithm. We consume uh, what we call 605, 606 data that are, are about how trades are routed and executed in the marketplace. And from that, we can extrapolate uh, whether demand is increasing or decreasing overall. And that's what you see here, you know, the, where the, the line moves. And where are we right now? Well, we're at to, we're at five three, which is not bad. Five, anything above five means that you have excess demand. Brian, maybe you can find that. Who needs to be muted? Sure. Um, and then on the supply side, this is this is Reg SHO Rule Two Hundred One data: short volume, not short interest. It is a core way that the market functions and is able to absorb uh, bursts in supply and demand. Do I love it? Uh, you know, it is what it is, uh, and it's at forty nine percent. So if you have and and it's and it it's been there for two days. So if you put this together, you would say, all right. So right into options expirations. That's those little green things. We had VIX expirations on Tuesday, holiday Wednesday, today. AM dated index options expired. Tomorrow is quad witching S and P. Uh, quarterly rebalances, that's context. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit here too. But right into Maybe these things, we have steady well, supply to to and no, demand at 5.3. Um, can you find that, Brian? I, I sure can. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Are you talking to me? Yes. So the what do you take away from this? Well, the, the market's likely Important to perform part. reasonably First well because ditch. supply and demand are kind of I'm tracking each other right into options right expirations. right now. It's live. Okay. Sure. Here, just mute it. Just mute it, everyone. I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. Yeah. Once again, if you can, just mute yourself uh, while this discussion is occurring. Okay, I want to go back to this. Uh, so you can know that the market's probably going to do kind of what you see. The NASDAQ is down. The S&P 500 is down. The Dow's up 330 points. It's the kind of market where you don't know exactly which direction it's going to go. I don't know. Is this at three days at 5.3? Is that a bottom or top? I don't know. It's right into options expirations. Um, it's very unusual, you know, that, that that the market doesn't hit the red line or close to it. 
Uh, so oftentimes the market continues on after uh, a, a, a pause like this. I don't know what it's going to do. But I do know that this is where we are from a supply demand standpoint. Context, returning to that, we know that options are expiring and they're heavily used in the market. Think of them as about 20% of overall market cap. So if all of that, that, that usage renews, there's no impact. If it doesn't, there is. And those renew on Monday. You know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. The index rebalances that are occurring, well, you know, you could say, well, where are we overweight or underweight? Uh, you know, we, you'd say, well, tech, we're way overweight tech. Yeah, but that's not necessarily how things work. Money will consume uh, the product that is readily available. You can do this at edge. You could go set up a, a portfolio like I have here for mega caps. And isolate for for uh, large caps, uh, large uh, or just mega caps, 100, 100 billion or more in market cap, and there are 113 of them. And if you look at that group, they are roughly 75% of all market cap, 100 stocks. Well, everybody's going to own those, and uh, that's why we look at big tech. Big tech's on your on your dashboard. Uh, the reason we isolate, we could change the composition of that, but it's a pretty good read on what everybody has to own. Um, I, you know, I was looking at this th earlier this week for the, the weekly blog, which we aim heavily at public companies. But I noted that if you look at the two, a, a couple of the largest index funds or mutual funds in the market, the largest actively managed fund and the largest index fund. The largest active uh, fund is, it's a capital group fund, capital research. It's the American Growth Fund. 270 billion uh, of assets under management. And if you look at the top holdings, uh, they're the big tech. If you go look at uh, VT Sachs, Van the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, $1.6 trillion in assets. Right there, you know the difference. You know, the passive money is five to one, the size of active money in terms of how the money is coming into the market. Now, it's, it's not, not all the way there from a money management standpoint, but it's important to know. Passive money absolutely dominates the, the market, not stock picking. And that money follows a benchmark. It wants beta, not alpha. It wants the performance of the market, not its not outperformance. And the interesting thing is that active fund costs 63 basis points and doesn't perform as well as VT Sachs does, which costs four basis points. So what is the point out of that? Well, that's why we track broad sentiment. That's what it is. And it dovetails into these rebalances. Passive money needs exposure to a certain percentage of, the, uh, of assets to equities. And it's going to tweak with those things and try to comply with the rules. We were all trading notes about this internally. Brian circulated some information about some ramifications of these rebalances. And these are things we have to think about now because the market is not, you start over every day at zero and everybody trades. There is a, there is a continuum to it. And so that's what we're trying to follow here. Uh, the continu continuum of the market, and there will be momentum opportunities. There are only six in this now. It's difficult to trade momentum during options expirations and index rebalances. It's much more challenging. And if you look at low volatility, stocks that have 2%, basically, or less daily volatility, they're going to hew very closely to the benchmark. That's where the concentration is. It's not enormous either. If I look at these two together, 30 is a fair amount, putting the two together. Uh, but it's not a lot. Okay, now I want to show you uh, one thing here, and I, I won't take up much more time. I'm going to talk about a couple of instances. Uh, I said I would show you where the it, broad market sentiment resides if you're using the daily trading ideas. Looks just like this at Interactive Brokers. You could click through a firm, which I still own, uh, hasn't moved. You know, I haven't produced a return on it. I'll tell you why I did. Uh, there, there are three stocks I'm going to talk about. But if you click right here, broad market you'll get that same view. So there it is. You know, it's just, you know, what's the difference? Nothing really. We're just displaying the same data in, in a different place. Um, and so this, th then you go to divergences. So broad sentiment, what is the big money doing? It's principally passive. It's going to be impacted by things that are contextual. That can include economic data, uh, Jay Powell speaking. Those things clearly have a big effect. Inflation data now. And then we look at divergences. There aren't a lot of them, 
you know, the, the only reason I am in a firm is because it's in the daily trading ideas. I'll go up here and click through. And while my probability diminishes, may not pay off. I might, might just have to leave it. But uh, the reason I am in this stock is it has not moved with very strong demand and falling supply. And it leads me to believe that either today or tomorrow, hasn't happened today, didn't happen Tuesday, that there are derivatives that could cause it to suddenly go boom. Now, it may not, but it does do that. And if it doesn't do that tomorrow, I'll throw in the towel and move on. I'm playing the probabilities knowing that I have diminished them because contextually, with options expiring, what if people don't renew? Well, then this won't be right because 20% of the implied demand here is derivatives that are resetting tomorrow and could renew Monday. And if they don't, the stock's not going to move. Uh, so that's the risk that you take. Now, on the flip side, the probabilities work very well. And I'll, I'll finish with this. There, you know, let's look at, I, I did this live for the Interactive uh, Brokers webinar last week. I traded Palantir live. And it's now out of the uh, momentum portfolio because the supply side has risen. But it worked perfectly, perfectly. You know, I, I just bought it in the, basically down half, a little, maybe a little bit more of the volatility. And I put a bracket on it to, to produce a you know, stop down 1% and, and a limit out up a little more than 2%. And I set it and I forgot it. And it did exactly what it was supposed to do. And how would I even know? Well, the probabilities are very high, all other things being equal, that strong demand and downtrending supply uh, are going to produce those gains. And it is a consequence of those conditions. Now, at some point, the rising supply side here will deteriorate these gains, and it might be next week. So if you're in Palantir, you know, I would take gains, not chances. Same thing with Dutch Brothers. Uh, I did the very same thing with BROS. Bought it in the, the uh, daily trading ideas indicated entry range. And I, why? Because demand was strong and supply was falling. It's now out of that portfolio too. Uh, and now demand's falling. And I put the bracket on it and I set it and I forgot. And it executed just as planned. Most of the time, call it, you know, roughly 68% of the time that'll work. What about what, during those times when it doesn't? What if you start to get stopped out? Well, it's probably an indication that maybe you just stop everything that you're doing because the conditions in the market are beginning to to uh, deteriorate or you have to tolerate more risk. I have to tolerate a little more risk in a firm. Am I willing to do that during options expirations? Yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll risk 2 2% <laughs> and we'll see. Uh, but the the point is, the math works. How else would we know? The market is very mathematical. It's 100% electronic, 98% algorithmic. Market makers are doing the same math, trying to figure out how to profit on short-term returns. We're looking just beyond their timeframes because you can't outcompete Citadel. And uh, you, you do the best that you can to set and forget, being aware of context. Okay, so that's what I've got. If you've got comments or thoughts, please feel free free to share those. And I'm going to hand it over to Brian Wilson to do part two. Tam? Tam? Yes. Wait, Steve, please. Uh, did, did you happen to see the news uh, that a firm put out this morning at four o'clock? No. Okay. Just might want to go read that. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a little frightening about the end of about everything. Yeah, uh, about home sales, uh, just the whole market, and uh, it's like everybody just read that, along with, of course, the facts that came out today. But uh, that was I was just getting ready to buy a firm, and uh, read that and scared me off. So, well, I'm not surprised, and it and and it, the and yet the price has not really moved, right? If you look at where the where it's trading now, let me just check that. It's basically um, the same same place, right? Yep. Yeah, it's about, yeah, it's it is exactly where it has been. And so the question is, will the news trump people's derivatives positions? I don't know. I mean, we'll we'll you know we'll we'll find out. The that that is there's certainly greater risk around options expirations. 
And I fully expect that kind of news. You know, do I think a firm is a great business? I do not, right? That is, there is nothing about that business that is appealing to me whatsoever. And I think it's a, it's a clanging klaxon of risk. But we'll see. You know, it'll be, it'll be very telling. Uh, if tomorrow, this, you know, because I'm, I'm likely to continue to hold it because it's not moving. You know, it's traded to, you know, 30-ish and it's traded to 30, 60-ish today. Um, and it's right where I, you know, it's uh, that's just a little bit below my, my entry uh, level. And I'm willing to take that much risk. Uh, and it's telling, you know, will the will the news trump it or not? We'll find out. Tomorrow options will get you if there's if there if people are going to do it, if somebody's going to try to run up the value of the options, they're running out of time to do it. So it'll either happen uh, early tomorrow or it won't. And if it doesn't, then I'll then I'll pull the plug. <laughs> <laughs> just, just no, I appreciate that. <laughs> appreciate yeah. that. And you know, do I look? I look at earnings. Um, I, you know, news can catch you out, no question. It can, and I think it's worse around expirations. Um, but what I have determined after looking at, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of studying these data is that those moves caused by news tend to mean revert, that overall supply and demand almost universally trump those outcomes. There are exceptions. I mean, what was it? We was, it was Celsius. Celsius, some sell-side mm -hmm. firm came out with a downgrade and it fell apart. That almost never happens. And so what do you do? I, you know, I bought it and sold it in the same blink of an eye because I had a, I had a stop in. <laughs> Uh, and, and it saved me, but uh, every now and then those things happen. All right, I'm chewing up your time, Brian. <clears throat> no, 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 no problem. Good to, good to see everyone today. A uh, couple of items to cover for me. Uh, I'm actually going to start with part of uh, Henry's note this morning. I thought he did a great job in terms of kind of outlining where we're at. Uh, but one, uh, well, I'll, I'll bring up two areas. I'll, I'll talk about this in just a moment in terms of uh, broad market sentiment and big uh, tech, both kind of topping at the same time. Uh, but I wanted to mention this to you in terms of passive money disappearing. Uh, where, you know, where can you find that? Uh, so if you go to, you can go to your big tech portfolio, that's where I'm at right now. And you can go to the behaviors. And if you look at the different behaviors, you can see right now it's actually being dominated uh, by active money. And the only one that actually has has passive money in it right now is Apple. So just wanted to show you, you know, if you're interested in, you know, what behavior is leading for a given stock, that's where you'll find that information. Um, I did want to point out uh, something that I don't do very often. A lot of you do it more, more often than I do. Uh, but occasionally I will kind of put my dip my toes in the options market. And I, I did that a couple of times this week, and I'll, I'll explain how I did it. Uh, I actually played in Apple a couple of days ago on the 17th, and I played in Meta on the 18th. And it was actually two different trades. Uh, I, bought, uh, I bought a put on Apple, and, and what I was using, I was using intraday volatility. So the day that I bought a put on Apple, I believe Apple was up 2.7%. Uh, the, the, the volatility number, it was basically above its intraday volatility uh, when I bought it. And I bought an out of the money uh, put uh, expiring tomorrow. It, it moved like 60 or 70 basis points and I made over 60% on it. Uh, but the point is I was, this is an extremely useful tool. Uh, I wasn't finding uh, a lot to trade in our daily trading ideas. And what I'll do with, with my trading is I will keep a watch on the top 15 names. I just have a Yahoo watch page. And you can see they're all they're all listed here. I have some of my clients listed down below. But you know, this is the top 15 names right now in the market. And I'm always watching watching those names. A couple of days ago, I noticed, you know, that Apple was a little bit of an outlier in terms of intraday volatility. And I was like, huh, I wonder if I can, uh, you know, benefit on that. Well, I, it, it worked. Uh, same thing with Meta. The next day, it was an it, it was an outlier, just the opposite. I bought bought a call on that one once again. 
60 or 70 basis points to the upside, and I, I made about 30% on that trade. So just a reminder that you know not only can we use intraday volatility with our daily trading ideas, but you can use it you know very easily uh, in the options market as well. And you don't need uh, you know big big moves to make sometimes significant amounts of money. So just uh, for those that like to trade options, just a couple of uh, couple of thoughts there. Um, my next thought today has to do with uh, just tracking the top components uh, in the S and P 500. And let me show you how you can do this. Uh, so I just do, you know, a, a search SPY components. Uh, you just go to the website. You accept the fact, uh, accept that. And then it comes here and just click on holdings. And then you can download uh, those holdings. And then, you know, do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, but let me show you what's happening with this. And John Cook does a wonderful job with tracking this information. This is a couple months ago. Uh, so same exercise, about two months, uh, about two months apart. And you can see that we're becoming ever more so top, top heavy. Uh, two months ago, top 15 names, about 39% of the SPY. That number is approaching 52 or 42% now. Top 35 names, about 52%. That number's up to about 54%. Uh, look at what happened to NVIDIA. Went from a little over 5% all the way north of 7%. Apple moved about 50 basis points from 5 point, no, excuse me, moved more than that. Moved up about 90 basis points, 5.8 up to about uh, 6, 7. So over time, you can see how these are moving. And if you want to go a step further, uh, you know, you can take those weightings and then, you know, use whatever the weighting is in edge, or not the weighting, but excuse me, the uh, demand broad, broad market sentiment. You can actually, you know, do further calculations. But the point being that we're very, very top heavy. Uh, as these move to the upside, it's going to move the market to the upside. And we just have to be careful, you know, during those periods when they move to the downside. Uh, now you can track these, you know, very easily. Most of the names are listed here in our big tech portfolio. Uh, you can create your own portfolio with that. Uh, I just simply call it uh, the top 15 once I get down here. Top 15, and it, it looks almost identical. Uh, to to big tech, I guess the difference right now a little bit of, of a difference in uh, short volume, but you can just create this. And in, in this case, this is a static portfolio uh, for me. It's not a dynamic portfolio. Uh, so that's a couple of the points I wanted to uh, point out today. Just those points about intraday volatility uh, and you know tracking the SPY. You know I would recommend setting up something similar to this. You can do it with a static portfolio. Uh, you can do it with that mega cap portfolio. Uh, I also have the same one uh, set up that Tim has, but but something that's showing you what's happening, uh, you know, with those larger components. Uh, Tim had briefly mentioned what's ahead, and I'll kind of go there with with this look as well. Uh, you can see that that big tech it's an interesting dynamic right now, and Henry mentioned this this morning. Uh, sentiment topping 7.2. It's traded at 7.4 uh, two days in a row. A lot of excess demand in big tech, very high short volumes though. And short volumes being higher uh, are, are okay for a period of time until demand slows down. And then you have excess supply out there that tends to weigh on share price. And that's the risk that we're facing right now is is this excess supply might start to weigh on big tech a little bit. We'll have to see how this plays out as we come out of uh, expirations. And it's a little bit of a tricky setup. I was trying to see the last time that we had this and I, I couldn't find another time frame. And what I'm what I'm pointing out here is the fact that this is the S and P 500. Uh, you can see that on a day over day basis. Uh, 17th versus 18th. 
we have companies that are bottoming 28% of the S&P 500, companies that are topped 39% of the S&P 500. And I've, I've actually never seen those two going together uh, at the same time. Uh, so that being told, it's it's a little bit of a confusing setup. If we try to make predictions right now, it, it's difficult because we have 39% of the companies that are topped. You know, which way do they go from here? We have, you know, 28% of the companies that are bottomed, but we have movement on, on both sides uh, of the of the equation. Uh, I guess from, uh, I'll cheat a little bit and just say from a broad market perspective, you know, that we're at, that we're at an inflection point. Uh, and that's part of why we have these green indicators here to let us know that we are approaching a potential inflection point where, where changes can be, uh, you know, forthcoming. So uh, just, just be careful for the next couple of days. There's nothing uh, alarming necessarily in the data. You know, sentiment 5.3, as Tim mentioned, that's good. Anything above five uh, generally supports gains. You can see on this one-year look that uh, that short volume at 49%. That's also good. You know, look look at the previous times where short volume was at that at that level. Both are both are fine. We're, we're just going to have to watch the data here because, as I mentioned, it is a little bit of a confusing setup when we have components that are both bottoming and topping at the same time. It doesn't provide us very good signals you know, at this particular time. <laughs> yeah, that, that's kind, it's kind of yeah. it for me. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for doing yep. that. Yeah, I actually, on Tuesday at 3.45 Eastern time, I put in a three to one short bet. So, it's, you know, three, a, mm -hmm. a short bet and a hedge that was levered three times long and I scrapped them before I pulled them right before I did the, the, you know, just before the window where you can't, cause they were market on close orders, meaning they were going to fill right at the close. And I chickened out cause I just thought, you know, I'm, I, the data don't, don't quite give me the right signal. And I don't know how that trade would have turned out today. Right. It's cause it would have been today. Would I have mm -hmm. gotten clocked? I don't know, but I, and it's a reflection uh, of of it, it, look, we're very we're very comfortable with market structure. Brian and I, we've been doing this a very long time, um, and we we under we understand this math really well. And it's uh, and this is unusual. I looked at the entire data set looking for uh, a, a similar circumstance, and there isn't enough data to draw a a, a good conclusion. And that this is an issue. You know, if you if you're looking and trying to predict an outcome, what you depend on is a trailing data set that gives you some certainty about what may occur in a particular instance, like Palantir. I was very confident, confident enough to do that trade live. I had an additional position, but I did uh, part of that live because I was very confident in what the data were telling me would occur. And I can tell you that I don't have a lot of confidence in the broad sentiment right now. Yes, yeah, Steve, please. Yeah. <clears throat> what have you ever uh, uh, studied a relationship of the overall market versus housing starts? This is pretty alarming. It's the biggest drop in housing starts we've had in years. Right. Yeah. It's well, those data have been so volatile. I mean, that the, it, it reflects, I think, a, an issue with a lot of those key economic indicators that the, you know, that the, the Fed relies on in the beige book. Uh, their, their housing starts, uh, jobless claims have been volatile and, and uh, unpredictable. A lot of those data points are changing. They get revised by 30 to 50 percent. So, no, I have not. You know, how I feel about that is, is that the, I bring my biases, as you know. I'm all about market structure because I like how it is the it is the um, it, it is the presentation of all motivations. Whatever the motivation, somebody out there is modeling that and is going and it's going to show up in the market. And you could go, you know, like I do. I've got a I've got a home builders portfolio, and I look at it. And you know, is the is the supply demand balance there? Does it believe the data? I'll believe the supply demand balance in the home builders portfolio way more than I believe those data 
because I think that the money is more informed than the, the statisticians. <laughs> I do. I think that da- I trade notes with the people from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and they're very responsive, and we have discussions about the data, but they can't answer my queries about why there are so many variables in the data. I will tell them, look, if I'm if we did what you're doing with this data, we would not have a reliable model. We need much more certainty in our data, market structure data, than than what the the government apparently needs in its its uh, labor and economic data points because they're they're not reliable. What of what use is a revised data point, right? And how, you've made the decision already, and then it's revised after the fact. Uh, for, so, uh, Forrest, uh, Forrest, Forrest, yes, please yeah. go ahead. No, I thought I would uh, just share Micron today. So you know, yeah. I looked at MU. And uh, before, because I go through my daily thing in the trade, and I like the yep. stock anyway. And I said, well, let's just hold on and see what the market's doing. Sure enough, it tanked. Why did it tank? Well, because they're new playing Syracuse, New York. They have to stall that because of an endangered uh, bat species. So <laughs> that put their earnings in the, the completion to 2025. So it's just delaying. When it comes November, they go in hibernation. They'll relocate the bat. But it just took it right on the chin, and then I I was going to buy it anyway. So I caught it way down the bottom. I'm up two point nine percent, and I was out. There you go. That's I'm what already you out. <laughs> I'm in and out. Because, and, but and but so I the, even if it went down, I was going to hold it anyway. Yeah, and Pam, so. you've got that. Yeah, uh, Barry, please weigh in. Yeah, I I uh, I just want I I fully agree with what Brian said. I think one of the most viable tools in market structure edge is in fact looking at the volatility especially with stocks like I said before that have good liquidity, especially in the options chain, you can really use that volatility to your, to, to, to your advantage. And the other thing was, is today coming in today's market, QQQ RSI was the highest it's been in many, many, many years. And so when I looked at market structure and when I looked at broad market sentiment, I'm like, okay, three days in a row, five, three flat, that's a soft top. So market yep. structure was telling us that there's gonna be some winners, but not necessarily in the big boys. And it was a clear indication, you know what? Long Monday, Tuesday, today into the end of the open, a good day to be short. Yep. And you were Just right. Just from what market yep. structure said. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. I I it's I think you're you're spot on there. And the presence of active money. You know, Forrest, I would add to the comment that, you know, that news causes machines that have derivatives positions to change direction, but their 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 horizons are very short. And then that mean then the supply demand imbalance mean reverts, and you can make it, you could still make your two percent, right? That's the always yeah, well, the key. You know, what do we care it, about, right? And the supply was going down a little bit, yep. and you had sentiment at ten. And uh, so it was, right. it was pretty good. I was comfortable either way with it. Yep. So. Yep. And I, Pam, I bet that it will work out for you too. I suspect that there is more demand for options coming. That, it, that whoever rolls Monday will roll favorably. I don't know. You know, you just never know with those things. But uh, it's probable. Yeah. You know. Okay. Well, that may be enough. That's good, guys. I appreciate you your, your weighing in. That was a good session. So thank you. Well, let's call it, Let's stop right there while we're ahead. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll do it again. I like take your games, week. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Thanks very much for joining. Good to see everybody. Yeah. Catch you next week. Take care, everyone.